the panel moderator is obviously going to take uh, the center stage right now quickly as I invite to the podium with a warm round of applause. I bring on Ed Ubong, coordinator, Decade of Gas. Please put your hands together for him. Next on our list here, we have um, Satish Kumar. Yes, yeah, Satish Kumar is an accomplished and experienced techno commercial person with over 25 years of experience in telecom, IT, energy, oil and gas. And I'll be bringing on uh, a professor, by the way. Absolutely. She's uh, Professor Zainab Gobir. She's Executive Director, Economic Regulations and Strategic Planning for the Nigerian Midstream and Downstream Petroleum Regulatory Authority. We have another very interesting personality right here. So ladies and gentlemen, please, I bring on Irogama Okbefo to the stage. All right, uh, our next panelist is uh, Monsor K. Akali. Now, Mr. Monsor K. Akali is the executive director of Midstream and Downstream Gas Infrastructure Fund of the Nigerian Midstream and Downstream Petroleum Regulatory Authority. Now, finally, we bring on our last panelist to the stage. His name is Dr. Billy Okoye, Executive Chairman, Raffles Energies Limited. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Please permit me to stand on existing protocols. I'm sure established since the early morning hours. Of course, I need to sort of get right. recognition of our distinguished senator in the room, uh, our chief host, the authority chief executive, Ladies and gentlemen, I know there are lots of entrepreneurs in the room, a lot of oil traders, lots of oil money. Uh, permit me to say a few words around gas. I think we're here to sort of look at how we can stimulate the economy through strategic actions. Uh, and this is just around, around gas. The story in Nigeria when it comes to gas is very simple. There is not enough gas at the surface. So we're having significant gas supply shortages. If we do not do anything in the short term, that shortage would grow to about 3 billion cubic feet per day. So when you see the pricing of cooking gas, which a lot of the people in the house use, it's because demand is stronger than supply. When you hear about the manufacturing plants looking for energy, complaining about the high cost of diesel, is because there's also not enough gas to get to them. And the country as a whole has taken a strategic decision to see how they can stimulate gas. And that's why the last administration had declared 20, 2021 to 2030 as a decade of gas. Uh, continuing with the current administration, with significant industry support. Special thanks to the chief executive. There is a secretariat in NMDPR annex in Abuja just looking at how we can solve that gas issue. That's where the decade of gas secretariat is. I'm opportune to coordinate it, uh, but it will basically answering the most fundamental question. How do we get more gas to the surface? Of course, we are blessed with significant gas resources under the ground, over 200 TCF, ninth largest resource holder globally. That we need to unlock those resources, we need to bring it to the surface, we need to increase local consumption in, in <coughs> Nigeria. If we do what we need to do, working with all the critical stakeholders, we believe that we can double Nigeria's domestic gas consumption within the next five years. We can also be in a position to provide the additional volumes that would allow LNG Train 7 to go live somewhere around 2026, 2027. That's another additional volume that brings significant revenues to the country. Today, we have assembled an erudite panel that will talk to you across various themes. Uh, on my right hand, we have uh, Satish Kumar, who will tell you some of the innovative work that is ongoing in the virtual gas distribution space. Of course, we have a Dr. Zainab who will talk to you about the strategy and economic planning that the regulator is doing around gas. Irogama Ogwefun will speak a little bit about what a new entrant in gas is facing 
at the moment. She's trying to swivel from being a maritime operator to a gas operator. Of course, the most important person on the panel <laughs> is Mr. Manso Alkali. He will tell us about this big midstream gas infrastructure fund that the government has put together. And now all of us can participate in it. And I think the fund is in dollars. So I'm actually very excited <laughs> to, to hear him. Uh, and then we will rotate to Dr. Billy Okoye, now in the private sector. But he has probably done all the jobs that needed to be done in NMPC before, <laughs> before his retirement. But Billy in his last role used to look at new ventures, business development. So I'll be very keen to hear from him how some of these key things can be done in the short term to stimulate the economy. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, I thought I was speaking today, but I've been told I am moderator. So I'm going to take my seat and listen to this round of panelists. I'm handing over directly to Dr. Kumar. Thank you. Thank you. My name is uh, Satish Kumar. I handle the business for uh, Greenville LNG. Okay, the, uh, one of the reasons about the gas which we discussed about how the gas can be reached to all the necessary uh, ecosystems, uh, Greenville has been in the front. So I would like to talk to you something how, how the gas can be generated in one place and then how it gets distributed. The key question is, most of the time, the gas is produced in one particular place, but then how best we could be able to reach it to the different part of the country is the question. Now, it has to be economically viable. At the same time, all the industry should be able to use it as one of the other options or other different options. So presently, we were uh, able to uh, convert uh, the gas into a liquid form and then transport it to longer distances. So that was one of the challenges we had initially about four, five years back, six years back. And 2019 or so, we ended up successfully uh, delivering the first LNG to the southwest market and then we moved on to the east and then to the uh, northern markets also so presently we are we able to so this particular sort of gas when we are able to reach to different uh, markets more industries would be able to come up and and uh, you'll you'll get to see the uh, situation of power gets improved at a much more economical cost so this is the initial uh, set during the course of the discussion. We would know what are the challenges, how do we go about with this, and uh, how do we come up with uh, solutions uh, with the best possible uh, uh, avenues which is available in hand. So thank you. Thank you, Jay. Thanks, Dr. Thanks, Kumar. I think we'll go straight I to... I think uh, uh, the next is Dr. Zainab. Yes. Madam. Yeah, please. No, she'll do it sitting. I think uh, I've been asked that we can sit. <laughs> Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Zena. Um, I'd like to stand on existing protocol. The authority chief executive, our um, able senator, thank you, and ladies and gentlemen. So your question is more around the, um, what we're doing in the authority when it comes to gas expansion. Um, there are two major programs going on right now. There is what you call Decade of Gas, right, which we're trying to achieve, you know, getting gas across the nation. And also, like you, um, the speaker had mentioned earlier, you to like getting those gas from the ground and being able to utilize it for the country and other participants. The second one is the Nigerian Gas Expansion Program. That is a subset of the decade of gas where, okay, how do we get this gas into the rural areas and make sure it's, it, it is adopted rather than what we see right now, which is using coal or, you know, going to the bushes and cleaning trees. Um, our CEO has actually been in the industry, sorry, sir, I'll put you on the mic here, since, you know, his younger days, since his NYC days. So he has seen everything and he's, purposely driven by services. His last um, measure is the 
stick method. Ace practiced what you call a lot of carrot method because he believes that when we enable the oil and gas sector, it's also an addition for us and other um, MDAs also generate revenue and the, we now have economic stimulations. So how do we go about doing that? We went about it by you know, writing regulations that are gas friendly, policies that are gas friendly, guidelines that are gas friendly. And then a lot of times we also intervene or collaborate with the private sector when they're dealing with government agencies. So a lot of times you see our authority chief executive even handling, you know, misunderstandings in the industry or streamlining how the industry is performing. Hence why you have commercialization. So for us, um, I'll never forget when I first started in this agency, he said, we're working with the private sector now. So when you call the CEO of ExxonMobil at 3 a.m., he picks up the call. I remember in my head saying, uh oh, this is a good time for me to turn work around and look for something else. But literally, when you call our chief executive, no matter what time it is, he answers the call. When you call our executives, you know, all the EDs, they answer the call. Our staff are very responsive because we want Nigeria to succeed and we want this gas expansion to get to the day-to-day -day Nigerians. That was his major task for us and our team, and that is what we've been focusing on. And so I think I can leave it there a bit till, you know, give somebody else a chance to talk. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, uh, Dr. Alkali. I think, I think a key bit of Dr. Alkali's submission is around gas-friendly regulations and the repositioning of the NMDPRA, which is the premier regulatory agency for gas in Nigeria to work more closely with, uh, with the industry. I'll go straight to Irogama, a new, a new entrant in the, in the gas sector to test some of these, uh, <laughs> some of these uh, comments that Dr. Uh, Zainab has just said. Iro, over to you. Thank you very much, sir. Um, I'd like to also stand on existing protocol. My name is Irogama Ogbaifun. I am the executive director of Stars Gas. So yes, we're a new entrant, but we've been operating in the shipping industry for over 35 years. Um, and I think three years ago when COVID hit and the word diversification became like a, as popular as bread, basically, every organization was trying to find what next to do, especially if you're operating within the oil industry, which we operate in, but we support the uh, production processes of the international oil companies. Um, and uh, my board gave me a mandate to, you know, find what's the new frontier for, for the company. And at that time, our chairman, had, our CEO had retired. So I had just stepped in as CEO of the company. So trying to chart a new vision and a new <coughs> path for the business. And of course, I went for NOG and the federal government declared the next decade as a decade of gas. Um, so just like a lot of other entrepreneurs who were in the room and also in the economy, we began to see that there was an opportunity here to participate and contribute to the value chain uh, for gas. But then there was the thing of understanding that value chain and understanding what it meant. And I think it remains something like a, an ongoing learning journey for a lot of people, whether you're an entrepreneur, whether you're a financier, whether you're an operator, just trying to understand exactly one, how serious is the government, which I think they're putting their money where their mouth is, literally through the funds, with CBN, and of course through sensitization pro um, programs and policies that have been passed. Um, but also just really seeing, is the market ready for these opportunities that are presented by gas? So at Stars Gas, we, set, we decided to play in CNG. So we're an energy firm we've set up to compress natural gas and then distribute through using virtual pipeline systems. Um, we're really interested in CNG as an autofuel um, and we're building a strategy and a model around it because we want to focus on conversion. So we have a, a design for setting up conversion workshops with sort of collaborating with fueling stations as well. And even in choosing the kind of equipment that we would deploy, such as our VPS, our virtual pipeline system, we're looking, we understand that um, looking at long distances, we need to be able to transport CNG. LNG is a bit easier, but CNG moving across. 
So we're really trying to use technology in deploying the solutions that we would like to offer to the industry. But there have been some positives and I'd like to just comment um, an MTPR. Obviously in this journey, being a new entrant and dealing with a new um, agency, um, we have had seamless um, um, experience with processing our permits and our approvals. So I, I would like to comment. I usually speak truth to power. If anyone's listening to me in the panel, I will not beat around the bush. If you're not doing well, I will tell you you're not doing well. So if you're doing well, I'd like to just comment to say that yes, because I had another conversation. I had a check-in with my project manager and he said, look, we don't have issues. Where well, in fact they're pursuing us, in fact they're encouraging us, so which is very positive for a government agency. I'm not operating yet, so I'll come back to you when I start operating <laughs> to let you know if I have issues. Um, but for now, I think that the government is doing what they need to do. But I think on the funding side, in interacting with our financiers, we're just finding that there's not a lot of clarity. The, the banking environment is not very, very clear on the sector. So there's not a lot of confidence, there's not a lot of um, willingness to take risks, especially with the more older generation banks. Uh, so, if we, so even though we're going to, you could source funding from a CBN or B, uh, a BOI intervention fund, you cannot do it in isolation, you need to partner with a commercial bank. So even if um, BOI and CBN are willing and they have the understanding, if the commercial banks are not clear, then there's a mismatch and you find that most companies like ours will struggle and continue to struggle with source funding. So I think um, some kind of thinking or strategy around how do we carry along the financial institutions such that they recognize the gas sector, although it being a bit upcoming as it were, but understanding that they need to support it with you know, the right kind of financing structure. The other is human resource. So we're obviously building a team and we are very clear, we defined our objectives as a company. However, we're struggling to find sort of matching sufficient human resources that's qualified to work. Um, something that needs to be talked about. I don't hear it really coming across during a lot of the conferences that I've held in the last couple of years since we've been speaking about the decade of gas. The part of training, capacity building, how do we deepen local um, human resource participation in the sector. So I think that that has to be looked at. We need to look at existing organizations or institutions. How do we empower them such that they can deepen that in, uh, and sponsor that. Um, the other bit will also be on private sector. Before I pass on to uh, Mr. Manta, it's on private sector collaboration. So we're going to have a different model in the way that we'll do our business. We're not going to be um, hoarding, as it were, because we, we want to be part of the government's agenda to deepen gas utilization. So we're not in it just to make money, we're also in it to make impact. So we're looking at how do we make our facility open, so it's not just for us as stars gas, but that other people can, who might not be at the level of having a plant, can come in and load gas, for example, right? As opposed to just saying, give me, your, you know, I want to steal your client and take it for mine and then we don't grow because one company or two companies or five companies cannot help the government achieve their plan. So we are looking to see more private sector collaboration where we're all in line, we have, we're aligned as to where we want to go and that the market is massive, it's huge. We haven't even started operating, we're already you know, talking with off-takers. The price of PMS, AGO are, you know, in the country is already helping to make the case or CNG or LNG, but if the private sector to sort of just sort of come together, which I think the Decade of Gas, the Decade of Gas office is trying to also facilitate, I think that it would help working hand in hand with public sector to achieve that objective. Thank you very much, sir. I will hand over here. Thank you. No, thanks, uh, thanks, Irogam. Right. I was putting the NMDRA comments to to the test, and it does appear like the ACE and his team have passed that uh, with flying colors. So a round of applause for the NMDPRA around licensing and permits. Yeah, excellent. But I think Iro, Iro raised an important point, I think, around funding. And, and I think it, it probably wasn't by chance that uh, Manso Alkali is sitting right next to her. And I would, I would uh, he, he had the, the midstream gas infrastructure fund. Uh, possibly uh, the only fund set up by law in the PIA to go around the whole sector, collect a certain percentage of gas, and then make it available 
for various industry players. But this is me reading the law from a different side. I'll hand over to Mr. Mansour to, to tell us a little bit on this team. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, I also maybe like to join my colleague speakers to stand on the already established protocol. Um, well, to start with, I think uh, we need to know where we are and where we are going from so that uh, you know we understand the basic uh, purpose of the fund. Um, we call Nigeria, uh, Nigeria the country of gas. Yes, we have gas. Proven gas level 206 trillion cubic feet. And to understand this number is enough to satisfy the energy requirement of the African continent for the next 100 years if properly harnessed. And I think this is a good story for Nigerians to know. Um, the gas that we have, almost 50 50, or there about one, uh, 150 come from associated foil, associated gas, and that's a non associated gas. We get the gas, most of the gas that we are now harnessing is from the associated, uh, associated gas, which is harnessed as uh, we explore the crude oil. And with all of the challenges now we're facing in crude oil production in this country due to factors such as uh, pipeline vandalization, oil theft, illegal bank run, and so on and so forth. It's interesting to know that uh, we hardly achieve our maximum of a quarter due to all these vices, even though the authority and other agents are doing a lot to see all these uh, vices are being substantially curtailed, which we are seeing a result from the recent uh, increase that we recorded in the production of the hydrocarbons in the country. Nevertheless, it's still work in progress. We still need to do more to see that we produce this gas. It's only when we produce the gas that the downstream will have something to feed the um, the midstream and eventually to uh, downstream for end users uh, uh, benefits. Now, this is where we are in this country. We only start hearing about auto gas, our CNG, when fuel subsidy was removed. And it just happened a few months ago, precisely maybe 20, May 29, when the president made the announcement. To me, personally, I think this is the best thing that happened to oil industry in Nigeria. It's only now that we know we need to move in line with the commitment of Nigeria towards net zero. Other than that, we still stick to our tradition of uh, fossil fuels in all our energy requirements. Now, where, where are we now in CNG? Before the removal of OCD, what are the infrastructure that we have? And I think barely less than 20 CNG dispensers we had in this country. And those one are able to operate at loss more of social services than commercial activity. Because you can't go and fuel your car with CNG when you buy you a liter of oil then at 200, 180 naira, when CNG costs about 200, 280. Nobody will do that. Now, the reverse is the case. Petrol now is 600, 620. But CNG is still within a relatively rate of probably maybe 350 to 400, which is still cheaper, much cheaper than the, the, the PMS. Not only that, the environmental benefit of using CNG is enormous. We all know about that one. So where do we go from there? Now, statistically, Nigeria will have about 12 million vehicles fueling, consuming about uh, maybe 45 million liters of PMS per day. Now, if you are bringing CNG, how do you satisfy these 11 million vehicles when before the subsidy remo removal, you only have, if you like, zero infrastructure of the CNG? Like from the north, it's almost zero, only hoping for AKK to deliver the gas. Why AKK did not deliver the CNG? then there will be no CNG in the entire northern part of the country. So why would the vehicle in that part of the country will get the CNG to run their vehicles? It's something that uh, needs to be you know, understood. So this is where we are now. First of all, the upstream produces the gas, the midstream processes it, 
and the downstream is polluted. So why will these two, three activities meet? And where are the gaps? And the gaps, I think, are for everybody to, is, is, is always, you know, in public knowledge. So what we are doing now and, uh, is that, first of all, as a kind of short-term measures, what do we do to provide this at least minimum CNG infrastructure requirement for us to replace the traditional PMC, PMS in the transport sector? And we are working with so many you know, interested uh, private uh, parties to, to come up with uh, projects that will produce this in mass. And, and I think, Ed, you know, you are part of the program that we are doing. We are serious of conversation and we are still working. And hopefully, before the end of uh, this quarter, something tangible will be uh, a role uh, as, as uh, we have been talking about. So, um, then the question is financing. And that's why the question comes of MDGF. You know, traditionally or historically, a discovery of hydrocarbon in Nigeria, most of the investment that produces the hydrocarbon were public funds. And from the 50s down to 80s, down to up to present moment now, when you look at the quantum of the public funds invested in this hydrocarbon and its result, you could say it's not very encouraging. And if we are now transiting, which the country chooses uh, uh, natural gas and transition fuel, we want to now replace the transition of uh, fossil fuel with natural gas. What do we do? Are we going still to use public funds to develop this infrastructure? And the answer is obviously, if we do that, we go back to the same issue of unsatisfactory results. Hence, now the introduction of the MDGF. So it's just introduced to support public sector, public private in, in, in investment towards the development of the entire gas value chain. We are not doing it alone. It's with you, the participant, you, the knowledge of people, you have been the industry, but then we have been this for quite a long time. The fund is here for you to assess purposely to develop this infrastructure required to replace the auto for the, the, the transition of uh, PMS, which will further harness the resources, the potential that we have in this country. By and large, uh, the good thing is uh, we are receiving very good uh, proposals and we are working on them and hopefully um, as soon as uh, due diligence is conducted, so many will be announced and people will be seeing the result all over the country. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Well done, well done. Well done. No, no, thank you, thank you. Uh, the mantra, I think, always, always key to hear him talk about the gas value chain building up from upstream that needs to produce the gas, midstream that needs to process it, before, of course, downstream where it is then sort of distributed, and how all these value chain players need to come together for it, uh, for it to work. Uh, of course, he has talked about the money part, as we expected, but like all money people, we will have to come back to him. Uh, because he spoke about due diligence, he spoke about very soon uh, how we can assess that money will be available. But uh, it, it sort of sets up very clearly for me to go to Dr. Billy Okoye, the only PhD holder on the panel, no, together with uh, uh, Professor Zenak. So Billy, Billy had many times and has been in various parts of the NMPC value chain, and I think one of the key areas he worked on was new, new ventures. And head of business development. And, and we are today around the gas sector, it's almost like a new business. It's a new venture for a lot of people. So I'll, I'll sort of pass that on to Dr. Okoye to sort of talk us through what his perspectives are. Okay, thank you very much, um, Ed. And um, uh, where is my boss? I permit me to take um, special recognition of my boss for life. The, where is the, the, yes, it's going to the restroom. Mr. Farouk Ahmed was my boss and um, he's still my boss. And uh, I'd like to take special recognition of him. He dotted the I's and crossed the T's in my sojourn to this industry. So I want to especially thank him for all he did uh, in this industry for me. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Farouk, wherever you are. Uh, please um, accept my appreciation. 
And um, thank you all of you for putting this together and uh, the NMDPR for taking the lead. I'm, I'm really excited that taking the lead on uh, this uh, year this year. Um, please continue to do this because you are the main regulator for the downstream. Okay? And not just the midstream, but the downstream, you are the main regulator. And the OTL is all about everything on downstream. So thank you for taking this lead. Uh, and please keep it up. Can we please give a round of applause to uh, NMDPR? Thank you so very much. Thank you, thank you. So today, um, this session, we are talking about stimulating the economy through strategic actions on gas development. And uh, Mr. Chairman, please permit me to take these actions um, through three perspectives. I'm a high chief in Iboland, and um, Ibos, you know, we're very practicable people. And so I want to take the perspectives from three practicable actions, okay, um, the, for us to use natural gas to stimulate the economy. And one is not by coincidence that I'm sitting beside the, the infrastructure. So number one for me is <laughs> infrastructural development. Okay, we cannot talk about stimulating the economy without talking about the infrastructure. Today we have the AKK being championed uh, by NMPC. That's a very good one. But what about the ones that we have already? The apps that we have. The apps was built in uh, 1989. Oh, here my boss comes. Thank you, my boss, for life. <laughs> uh, I was just appreciating you for all you did in my life. God continue to bless you, sir. Thank you very much. So, um, I said, um, what about the ones we had before? We're talking of AKK, which is a very good, fantastic project to take the cars from uh, Jokuta to uh, Kaduna to Kanu and then touch the industries along the, along the line. But what about the ones we have today? So it's good that we have uh, Ed, um, who is championing the Cape for Gas. We have apps. We have Escavos Lagos uh, pipeline that's been there since 1989. What are we doing? Can't we expand that? With the expansion of that pipeline, you will see a lot of development in Lagos area. So I will encourage you, please, and it's good that I have my brother who is here with me, to please liaise with NMPC, and we have a very sharp, young, very focused young guy who is the, um, the EVP um, Gas Development, Mr. Olaleko Ogunle. He's a very proactive guy, very practical guy. Please, I want you to please engage with him and expand that pipeline. If we expand that EPS pipeline, it will help a lot in bringing gas to the industrialized city of Lagos. So this is very important. This is my, my number one recommendation. And I want to talk about incentives. We have left subsidy for gas, for PMS, because that was actually subsidy for consumption. So today, let's talk about subsidy for production. So let's move from subsidy for because you can never run away from incentives when it comes to production. You can never operate in isolation overseas. If something is done, you must find ways to incentivize the gas industries. It could be through tax incentives. Okay? If you do this, you will see a lot of developments that are going to come in. I know that the present regime is all about taxing uh, they are talking about increasing taxation, but I agree you can increase taxation for consumption, but please, for production, you need to incentivize the producers through tax incentives. So that's the, my, my number two. The last one I want to talk about is skills development. Skills development. The PIA touched on it, and um, uh, it's something that we can never run away from. Okay, we must build our own. We must develop this industry by ourselves. We don't want to wait for anybody to come and develop it for us. We must develop it by ourselves. Okay, and that's why I've taken the lead uh, as soon as I left NMPC 
I went to the academia and I lectured University of Abuja where I introduced a department called um, Oil, Gas and Energy Marketing. And the whole idea is all about association planning. We want to build the young ones to take over this industry to build on where we have stopped or where we are stopping. So please, we encourage the industry participants to do what others are doing in other business schools all over the world. Sponsor cheers. Sponsor your, 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 your staff. Sponsor your members of your staff to empower these skills that are very much needed. And I believe that when we do all this, it's not just talk and talk, but being practicable. And that's why I said that it's good to not just to come to conference and talk, but profile solutions that are practicable. And I think that these three solutions, if we do, we'll be able to stimulate the economy and develop our gas infrastructure. Thank you very much for this opportunity. God bless you. Thank you. Always, always a pleasure to listen to Dr. Koye. And I mean, we broke it down along the need for infrastructure development, what we needed to do around incentives, not incentives for consumption, but incentives for production. I think a very important distinguished point he made there. Uh, he also sort of went back to a theme I think we had heard earlier on around skills development. How how do you build capacity uh, for gas? Uh, I think there is still one question, just building on what Dr. Koye has sort of touched on around infrastructure. So in gas, your main infrastructure is gas pipelines. Uh, but we all know the challenges with building gas pipelines. He's spoken about the AKK, he's spoken about the Alps. The Alps uh, continuously is being worked in terms of expansion. The AKK project is still ongoing. Uh, it hasn't gotten to Abuja yet. We are looking forward to it getting to Abuja and then going further north into Kano and Kaduna, actually being monitored on a monthly basis by the current Minister of State for Gas. So we hope that monitoring can lead to, to clear, tangible results. But, we, but, but, but apart from that physical lines, I think there is also uh, the innovation in gas around virtual infrastructure. And there I will come back to uh, Kuma to sort of talk to us because they are actually the innovators. They are the first company in Nigeria to use LNG and trucks to deliver gas across various parts of the country. And I'll be very keen to hear his own experience and maybe a challenge. What has been your biggest, biggest concern? Kuma. Thank you, um, Subong. Usually, uh, what happens, I mean, let, let me put it in a different perspective. So let's say, for example, I'm just giving you an example of a farmer or an industrial or an entrepreneur who is in Maiduguri or in a different part of the country where there is no option of uh, having gas, but then he wants to intend to start a factory. Now, what happens is about three years before this, I've just told this before also, three years or four years before, if anybody would have told that, uh, will there be a gas in Sokoto or in um, any part of the northern part of the country, people would have just laughed at us. I mean, you know, there is no options at all because the pipeline is not even coming anywhere closer to it. AKK is still in the, I mean, you know, it's still in the construction phase and, and of course, as Mr. Wong said, it is coming up to Abuja, though we presume that it will fast track with the current dispensation and which we pray it should also because the faster the dispensations the, because the entire market is going to explode further now what happens is that now later about three years before that was a question but now today we are able to deliver gas up to Sokoto that is something which is impressive not many people knows about it but natural gas is used for power generation and for heat needs so tomorrow you want to start a cement factory or you want to start a glass factory, you want to start uh, manufacturing any type of cool drinks, anything. I mean, you want, you want to, anything you want to start in any part of the country, gas is available. That is what exactly what I would like to tell you. Now, commercially, whether it is a viable proposition, of course, yes, 
there is a certain amount of capex expenses involved but then if the guy or the entrepreneur is willing to go ahead with that i think it is a good way of uh, going ahead to use gas let me just give you an example the moment a gas pipeline starts uh, getting constructed in a particular area do you know that the land cost in that nearby area increases almost three times or four times of the place today you cannot have a land somewhere close to shagamo simply because there is a gas pipeline available there if you want to start a factory closer to the pipeline every single guy will initiate initially you may not know that the factories may not come up into that place but once you start building slowly you will see it is like a bee it is like an ant slowly one after another one after another it will start coming today in shagamo you do not have any land to open up a factory everything is taken i am talking up to um, ogere now the pipeline is even getting constructed by uh, nipco up to ogere it they might come anywhere closer to ibadan probably in a years two years down the line so how long will it take to even to reach to other part of the country one side is akk is coming so there are different different options of course the challenge now is even now if anybody in any part of the country wants to set up a factory and if they need a gas you have lng if they are very closer to the pipeline but yet they are not able to reach up to the pipeline level they can use cng that is from the pipeline you can have a compressing station from there about 300 kilometers you can start using the gas and which is far more cheaper uh, today as compared to diesel so a 1 megawatt of power plant just imagine if somebody opens up 1 megawatt he has to spend about 6500 liters of diesel a day so you can imagine about 200000 liters of diesel in a month that's the kind of huge amount of money close to 200 million is going to spend only on a diesel alone to to run a business that flow will go bankrupt so if he is able to get it probably half the cost the final uh, output or the uh, final product what he finished product which comes out will be far more cheaper he will be more competitive he will be able to make uh, his base uh, profits more whereby he can distribute it to his employees so these are all some of the factors which will uh, which will uh, form to have uh, i mean you know use of gas i mean that's the advantage with the use of gas so i personally feel even now um, it's not too late though the uh, state and the federal and the government and everybody are running to make sure that uh, more pipelines are built more cng stations are coming up and uh, uh, what do you call uh, more uh, uh, i mean you know uh, other type of gases are going planning to come out so but now lng is definitely available that's one and cng is also predominantly available in the southwest and more pipelines are coming now coming to the second part just i'm just extending taking a little bit more further now you know we are talking about no auto gas because of the pms uh, increase in the prices um almost many of the uh, retrofitment companies have already landed in the country there is about how many cng stations we have now about 5 6 7 8 or 8 all put together is about 8 stations are available now there can be more cng stations which um, i mean as i'm i'm promoting my company again this what i'm trying to tell you is this greenville is also coming up with more lcng stations which means we are bringing lng to the farthest corner of the country where there is no pipeline any sort of gas is there convert it and make a cng station there so that the local kks or kk marwa and the local cars can use cng as an optional fuel when the price of the pms in case if it goes beyond 600 or 700 or 800 we don't know i mean whatever it happens we'll be able to use as an optional fuel that's one number 2 there is a retrofitment center if it is able to open and which i personally think which uh, i had a meeting about a week back with to one of those companies i told them you need to encourage opening up retrofitment centers closer to the cng stations now there's a cng station which is in ibafo there's a cng station in kaduna open up a retrofitment center put up say that there's a retrofitment center available please anybody who wants to convert uh, uh, their cars or kks please come over here get it converted Uh, take the cng from the uh, close by cng station and start using it anyway you are going to use pms anyway you are you're going to use gas if you find a cng fill up the cng if you find a petrol fill up the pms keep moving 
at least you will be able to save about 30% on the cost. We presume that the CNG pricing, that's where the DPI also comes into play. Uh, well, the fact of the matter is, uh, if you're able to close up somewhere as uh, uh, Sir had said about the 400 Naira or something like that, but even now it's somewhere closer to about 500 Naira or so, then we are able to still, because on a CNG, the mileage on the motor is about uh, 15 to 20% more than even on the uh, PMS. So you save there, you save on the cost also, making it about 30 to 35 percent. So more retrofitment centers comes into place. It's it's a it's a it's a, it's a big go uh, immediately. And Benin is one area where there's already CNG stations available, which which uh, the poor number of retrofitment centers have not opened up. So that's the that's the current story, sir. No thanks, uh, thanks, Kumar. Okay, good. Uh... Good conversation there. So, so you've heard from, from him himself, there is gas all the way to Sokoto in LNG. Even now, they're now doing LNG to CNG, just to be sure that you can then also use it within that local area. I think you also touched on an important point, which is important around the need for dispensing stations. And, uh, and for us in the decade of gas, we will not succeed with auto gas and gas penetration if we are unable to replicate what currently happens now in downstream and PMS, where every short distance you drive, there is a filling station, you can go in and fill your car. Uh, and one of the key points that we have heard has been how the current PMS operators can quickly transition and be able to have this gas dispensing station so that we don't need to reinvent building new stations all over again where they can put a gas dispensing station within them. And I'm coming to you directly, Dr. Uh, 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 Zainab. On a regulatory perspective, Sorry. is this something the authority is already enabling or looking at? Where we don't need to reinvent the wheel 100%, but if you're already an operator in downstream, you own filling stations, then it becomes very easy for you to put a gas dispensing station for you. But I'm keen to hear your views. Thank you, sir. Um, yes, it is something the authority is actually working on very closely, especially the midstream and the um, ERSP directorate where you have um, network code. That is, you know, is a system that allows people to ride the same pipeline but different times, right? And um, we monitor closely. It's just like a, you know, an airport type of trafficking, but you're trafficking, in this case, gas, right? So we have that. Um, I actually wanted to touch on the incentives. Gas has great incentives. There's eight different incentives that we have, the oil and gas sector has. One is tax, customs, immigration, cash flow incentives. There are two more that I can't remember off the top of my head, but you know, so this, again, is the government and the PIA showing you that, you know, we, we are very serious about this gas uh, being a transition pool, and we know that this is Nigeria's way in to the world. Um, the third thing is, based on this network coding, this now gives companies what you call gas planning activities, right? So now you're structuring everybody and bringing everyone to be coordinated and make smart business decisions. So, for example, um, Greenville was saying, okay, maybe in the near future they will use rail or they will use truck or any other, or the um, infrastructural funds, which is the, excuse me, the um, gas pipeline. So the authority right now is positioning itself where these are the three options available and will give you a roundabout part of how much it will cost you if you choose to move your gas using rail or you want to move your gas using truck, or you want to use your gas moving um, using the pipeline. pipeline. So smart business decisions are happening. Um, the ACE also is very heavily invested in our Consumer Affairs Bureau, which is where we actually get in touch with our stakeholders and find out what can we do better? What can we do to enable your business? What do you need from the authority? We're here to make sure you succeed. So we have that, and then the last one is we also have business planning, gas planning, because if we don't collectively, you know, plan this milestone together, it will fall at different levels. 
So, which is why the ACE is championing the Decade of Gas project, where you know there's a secretariat, there are people there. Each um, player knows where they come into the where they come in in the process and what they're to deliver at each milestone coverage. So, as you can see, we are already making the news, but we're not perfect. So, we're open to if there's um, constructive criticism, constructive um, discussion, right? One of the things we try to do mostly on our regulations, our policy, we, it's very, very involved with the private sector. So before we roll out any regulation, any guideline, we have people come on board, you know, we sit, we talk about it, we argue about it, we understand your pain points, and we now figure out how do we resolve this amicably where all parties are happy. So, you know, the authority is literally championing a lot for the oil and gas sector, and like our CEO would say, we just started. So you can imagine the galvanization you will get next year in terms of deliverables by the authority. Thank you very much, sir. Mr. So Zainab, I think good, uh, good point. I think key message there is the authority is ready. Whatever the regulations that are in place, they are open to discuss it uh, with critical stakeholders and make, make whatever adjustment or changes are needed to drive, uh, to drive the market. Dr. Okoye spoke about the various value chains around gas and for most players, they sit around the midstream sector. So, I mean, this question is to you. You cannot really run a facility or a CNG facility without a gas supply agreement, usually long term, 5 or 10 or 20 years. How is that discussion coming up with the upstream players? Yeah. I beg to plead the fifth. Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> that was the toughest one. Um, well, that's a very interesting question, Mr. Moderator. And I think, um, first of all, being a female led gas business certainly um, has encouraged support uh, for, for us, for new entrants. So I must give kudos to those who are sort of promoting and you know enabling and creating a platform for more women to come into the sector. Uh, I've been a beneficiary of that because once I approached the uh, company that we were interested in potentially getting gas supply from, the CEO's first words were, I'm going to support this because we don't see a lot of women you know, who are bold enough to go in there. So that's, that's good. But um, we started with a quite a rigorous uh, process and it's been a rigorous journey. I think uh, we've been on it for over 10 months and we've only just gotten a draft um, and we're still yet to discuss commercials. So I, I think in the earlier session there was a question that came out around how important clarity and uh, certainty is, right? And I think from a pricing structure, I find that a lot of the uh, operators are finding it difficult to tie themselves into these contracts because pricing is not, you know, the commercials are not very clear. So whilst we're, we're inching along very, very slowly, we're almost there, but we're having to really push with a lot of power. And, and then there's also the fact that they have JV partners. And whilst the private sector partner is ready, you know, willing to see, let's go as far as we can, there's the roadblock from the JV partner. I don't want to call it, you know, the JV partner is just sort of there and has a critical role to play, but it's caused a lot of delay. So right now, the big roadblock we have is that we haven't been able to get to the discussion table with the JV partner and you know the private sector partner, company sitting together to discuss any commercial so we can progress. But so we're working based on commitment, right? But my bank, I can't take that to the bank, right? All I can take to the bank is a document to say I have a gas supply agreement. So I think if there is a way to, I don't know what, who or what unblocks that, but it's there and I'm sure that a lot of other um, companies, and this is also not even with large volumes. Our volumes, what we're requesting for is not even that large. So imagine a company who is trying to access large gas volumes it's going to be um, a big point. But well, you also stated something here, which would probably um, be a deterrent as well for signing a lot of gas uh, supply agreement, which is, where's the gas? I don't want I'm oversubscribed, I'm committed, and you're asking me to commit some more, but technically, do, we have, do I have the gas? Or when will I have the gas to actually supply in those sort of large volumes? So we're lucky because our volumes are 
relatively you know, manageable and they're saying, look, we can commit to this very easily. But then, you know, for the scale of work and the speed that we're trying to, you know, the industry wants to push, the point you raised earlier around gas development, you know, um, it's very critical and the NMDPRA has to just see how they work with your uh, region, you know, a decade of gas, push that and then we, and you know, uh, get encouraged to even expand because then we know that we we'll get that supply. Thank you. Thanks, uh, thanks, thanks, you're right. I think the message there is the, the gas supply agreement is moving, but it's probably not moving as uh, as fast as as maybe the private sector would, would love to see. And I think there's some work there working with the joint venture partners who on one hand have the dilemma, you want more gas, but we have not brought more gas yet to the surface. So I think still back to that question, how do we get more gas volumes? Uh, uh, to the to the surface, uh, I would have I would have loved to ask a question around around pricing, but but uh, I'm looking at the ace and he's looking at me. <laughs> but I would I would I would possibly maybe go to uh, to man. So I mean I mean in the in the thing really, you cannot walk away from price. Yeah, because pricing is a be a key input into whatever for. Uh, during the, the the sort of MDGIF, uh, do we do you do you have any comments to make around around the domestic gas pricing, Manso? Oh sir. me, yes sir. Domestic gas pricing. Yes, it's honestly, I was. It would be fair for it would be unfair for you to ask me this question <laughs> because my only need to provide funds for the development infrastructure. Pricing is entirely not in under my purview. But uh, by and large, you see, I know there are challenges in pricing, largely because of, uh, you know, the junk costs. You know, a lot of concession has been given to junk costs so that, uh, you know, the cost of energy will not be that high, will be the affordable uh, reach of uh, ordinary Nigerians. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, the cost of production is also high. The cost of resources needed to bring this gas is high. So it's a matter of economy of scale. What do we do? We have to strike a balance, right. and I think it's not for me to say categorically this is how to address the flashing issue. It's a very uh, delicate issue, and uh, it's something that I think uh, the authority has been talking to uh, in collaboration with all the key st uh, st major stakeholder, uh, stakeholders to arrive at an acceptable, affordable, and sustainable pricing of this product. I think that is the key. Thank you. Okay. No, thank you. Uh, you had something to say? I wanted to jump in there a bit. Um, so in terms of pricing, we've actually sat down with several stakeholders. Greenville is actually one of them, NNPC and you know different stakeholders to talk about how we come about this framework for pricing. So here are the cost elements. So there's three types of pricing um, templates you have. We have import priority principle, export, and then cost plus. So what we've done is we've sat down with stakeholders and said, okay, this is what's going on, and this is what the federal government is expecting to happen. However, tell us your perspective on you know, how we can go about getting this to be fair on all grounds. So we've had the submissions. Um, our ACE is working assiduously on it before we um, release it. So when you see him, he, he knows, he knows, he, <laughs> he has it, but he's waiting for the right time to put it out there in the market because again, the authority thrives on the success of all oil and gas players and he comes with that experience he knows the pain point and he's guiding us all to make sure that we feel that process and that framework so we already have a framework but we're still finalizing the um, pricing um, elements okay, thank you well, thanks professor zena thank uh, man thank uh, around the domestic gas pricing lots of stakeholder engagement going on yeah. Uh, the ace has something, uh, and at the right time, the ace will say something. Is what I'm, what I'm hearing. So we will, we will all keep our fingers crossed and wait for that. But I'll rotate to, to, to serve, uh, Dr. Ben Okoye. I mean, you've, you've had the privilege that most of us on the panel don't have. You've, you've walked through the NMPC space. You've now been in private practice. I'm very keen to sort of get your view whether. What are our chances of succeeding? 
as we try to pivot to gas. What do you feel? I mean, you understand the government side, you've now side, and I think like you said, you were an Igbo man and you were very pragmatic. So it would be, be good to hear that pragmatism. I think there's an um, absolute need for collaboration between all the stakeholders, the government agencies, the private sectors, okay, and um, the, the, the government agencies, the stakeholders, and the private sectors. If there's no collaboration, then we're going nowhere. Like I said, this industry belongs to all of us, and uh, you, don't, you don't pass the buck. If we keep passing the buck, oh, leave everything for the government agencies, private sector, go and um, just try to keep passing the buck, it would not work. So there's that absolute need for everybody to come together. We have declared the decade of gas. The world is watching us. So it's not just good enough to go to COP26 and say, oh, we're going to be ready for net zero by 2060. And we don't want to wait by 2060, we say we want to shift the goalpost again. Mm -hmm. Okay? So a lot lies on you, um, Ed, who is championing the decade of gas to galvanize everybody, okay? So that um, that collaboration is absolutely necessary. And I'm happy that um, um, the regulator is here, okay? Uh, again, it will also be good to get involved the NMPC Gas and Power. I'm surprised they are not here. But uh, it would also be good to get them fully involved, you know, so that we all can work together. And um, in the long run, we'll, we'll be able to use gas effectively as our energy transition fuel and get to where others are. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ben Okoy. I think great, great to see that positive comment. Uh, but I think there is someone is signaling something. But I think I, I, will, I'm, I mean it's it's become almost a custom at, at most of these panels not to take questions from the audience. But I am very keen to hear at least two questions from the audience before we close. All right. Good afternoon, everyone, panelists. And I just want to so with respect to the MDGIF um, the fund. Mm -hmm. um, can it, is it extended to um, operators that have assets that have non-associated gas? You know, because back to Irogama's um, point, she said that one of the issues that the current EMP operators have in terms of entering into the GSAs is about sufficiency. They don't want to over commit and then fail. Now, I know that most of the gas we've been talking about has been AG, which is the associated gas. Now, the non-associated gas is where the field itself is predominantly a gas field, and then production of it. The, what really would encourage some of those that got those assets during the last marginal bid round might be maybe if they can access some of the funds from NDGIF to, um, for them to process the gas, I mean, explore the gas, process it, and possibly um, if they want to invest in infrastructure in terms of um, transportation, yes. Otherwise, they can partner with the likes of um, Eurogamma's company to continue the value chain. So I just wanted to know if that fund can be extended to those that actually have those assets that are predominantly gas assets. And the second one, maybe from the site of NMDPRA, the answer might be there is, what are the qualifications required for um, any of the midstream and down, downstream operators to access the MDGIF funds. I know for the NCIF, you must have been one of the contributors to the NCD levy, but I don't know what the criteria is for the MDGIF and do you need bank guarantees, is it a BOI operated fund, how really is it being administered? I'm a finance person and it would be useful to get some of this information so that I can advise my clients and point them in the right direction. Thank you. My question is, 
how much was under the management of the MDGIF as at the last day of last month. Okay, I think, I think we should, let's take those two questions like I suspected. Yeah. Money is. No, no, all MD. Yeah, so we we'll to call uh, the MD for the midstream infrastructure fund to sort of just throw some light on those two questions. Okay, thank you. I think the first uh, uh, speaker talked about uh, development of uh, non associated gas field, right? I think the mandate of NGS is clearly stated in Section 52 of the PIE. Development of non associated gas field is entirely upstream activity, it's not covered statutorily by MDGF fund. There could be other funds that will address that concern. Secondly, you talk about uh, uh, the requirements. Well, first of all, you see, for you to assess the fund, whatever activity you have to do in the entire gas world, you have to be licensed by the authority. That would be the basic requirement. You know, I don't want to categorically say, do this, do that, do that, but just obtain the licenses be it gas pipeline, be it gas fish plant, be it uh, NLG, whatever. Once you get the license and you have the basis for us talking to MDGF, the license is your passport, the fund is your visa. Now, you know, you must have your passport and visa depends on the embassy you are going. So the fund depends on the activities that you are to embark on each one. Once you get the license, we are here to guide you and uh, we'll help to see whatever that you could not uh, bridge, we see that you, you succeed in uh, uh, obtaining the fund, right? The, then the third question, what was it? Is it oh. also about the last speaker? Is it also about NDGF? NDGF must assess the fund. What? The account. Mm -hmm. Very easy. You can calculate it. The law says we collect 0.5% of the entire sale of wholesale of domestic uh, products, petroleum products and natural gas. We know the volume. PMS now we are saying 44 million liters. You know the price and calculate and see what is 0.5%. You can even calculate daily and see how much we are getting. However, it will interest you to know that uh, you see the authority is empowered by law to collect this money on behalf of the fund. Also, part of the income of the authority comes from that 0.5%, i.e. 1% is collected by the authority to be shared between the MGGF and the authority for the running cost and for the fund. Now, before the removal of the subsidy, you see there's an issue whether the authority can collect 0%, even though the law empowers the SUSO. But the authority felt that it's like you are adding additional burden to the subsidy regime of the federal government. When the federal government is struggling to cope with the subsidy, the huge amount involved in subsidy. Now, if you now enforce that zero five percent, what will be the consequences? It means pushing additional burden to the federal government. So, so, so there was that uh, you know leniency from the authority that the money was not being collected. Now, after the subsidy was removed, then structures were put in place to collect. But there is a kind of. Uh, reluctance on the operators to come up with pay and that's what uh, Dr. Zoro should talk about enforcement that the authority is yet to task enforcing collection we want people to understand this money is for the industry to develop let them voluntarily come up and make the payment without necessarily receiving the hammer of the authority to see that collection is being enforced let it be in a friendly atmosphere let's be in a collaborative and uh, something that we all know that is something for us to, the industry for us to develop, for us to contribute our all quarter. So it's from you, the operators, that you, you need to also read up your account and see that you pay the, due, the, 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 the levy as at when do without necessarily being hammered by the regulatory authority. I, I, I think that's basically all the questions, isn't it? Am, am I, have I answered the questions? All right. Yeah, I yes. think I think I think you have, sir. sir you've, uh, you've. I think the summary is collection is. I think it's in progress, but it's. I mean, it's almost like an enforcement of, of and that that is something that is being uh, being sort of worked on by 
by the authority. Uh, and, and I think for the first person who was interested in, the, uh, please send your to, to the NMDPRA. I think they will look at it. If it falls not upstream, it will be redirected. If it's something that sits within the midstream and infrastructure where the MD chairs, he would be something he would uh, take up. Ladies and gentlemen, I think it has been a fantastic time to, to this erudite uh, set of panelists from Dr. Bill Okoye, who has been able to paint a picture from the lens of the regulator and the private sector. Manso, who holds the money, he's still holding it. Uh, and. Uh, Gamma, who has recently ventured into gas, its challenges, what has worked, the permitting process with the end, the conversation around how to get gas supply agreements in place. To Professor Zenap, who has also sort of painted the picture around where we are around gas pricing. A piece of work that has been done, consultations continue with various stakeholders, the ultimate decision sits with the ACE. He has received the piece of work at the right time and completion of those stakeholder engagements. He would also make that information available to the whole industry and we continue to wait. Of course, we've had the opportunity to listen to the Greenville story where even today, of all the challenges, GAP can be made available to you in Bornu or in Sokoto via trucking, virtual gas pipelines, and even also see it. All right, now put your hands together once again. <laughs> we would only succeed if 50% uh, of the house can switch from selling PMS to, to gas.